Hello and welcome to the Bible study. My name is Kent Philpott. This is program number 18 in our series of the book of Revelation. We are in chapter 8, which means we're moving right along. And this chapter 8 now, we're going to find the opening of the seventh seal. We're going to start dealing with the trumpets. Now, I've said this a few times, but I'd like to say it often because it took me many years to understand this. And when I first began to hear it, I didn't really accept it. It was kind of hard to, uh, hard pill to take because I'd been used to such a different point of view. Uh, when I first became a Christian, I was taught that the book of Revelation started from the very, told the story of the early church and went all the way, all the way through to the end. Then, in more recent years, maybe 20, 25 years ago, I, I changed my opinion. You know, Christians are free to change their opinion. Uh, I've, I've questioned about every single doctrine that I've ever come across, and I think it's important for every Christian to do the exact same thing. You have to make it your own. It doesn't work in the pinch, you might say, uh, just to regurgitate what you'd always uh, heard before. You, you have to process it yourself. You have to deal, think through, question, etc. And uh, perfect theology I didn't have when I became a Christian. I didn't really know who Jesus was. I didn't know any real story about the crucifixion. I didn't even understand there was any such thing as Holy Spirit. Um, I'd never read the Bible. I didn't know anything but all of a sudden, I was trusting in Jesus. I was born again. And, um, and I mean, talk about a raw recruit. And so I just imbibed everything that the church I was a part of then said. And then later on, I went to seminary, and some of that changed. And after I got out of seminary, it changed some more. And I hold the door open to changing anytime I have a tendency to think that I think the Bible is saying something else, which does continue to happen in small areas, nothing that really touches the Apostles' Creed or the essential doctrines and um, creeds of the church, but there are so many other things. And the, looking at the book of Revelation is one of these. Now I see that the book of Revelation says the same exact story seven times in three major ways, the seals, the trumpets, and the bulls. It's not sequential, but it tells the story of the church and the world right up until the end time, and it tells it seven times. As I say, three major times. So that did not come easily to me because I had been taught absolutely reverse. But, uh, you know, our salvation does not hand, uh, hang on that sort of thing, and it is not the determination of whether or not we're liberal or moderate or fundamentalists, or any of those things. Um, but people like to say sometimes they are. Well, I've had people hear my view of Revelation and say, oh, well, I guess you've gone liberal, Phil Pot. I'd say, no. I said, uh, we have differing ways of looking at things, and I think my point of view may, may say to your point of view that you have a liberal point of view. <laughs> you know, it can go either way, because... We don't know exactly for sure. It's open to interpretation, and, and it's, that's an important and a healthy thing. The dangerous cultic church demands uniformity of belief. And uh, there's prices to pay if you don't toe the mark. And that is not authentic Christianity. That's dangerous and toxic Christianity. So, that said, we're going to go into the, the chapter 8 now. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, here the Lamb is, that's Jesus, of course, the Passover Lamb, the sacrificial Lamb sacrifice on the cross. There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Uh, the Talmud says that uh, God brings silence so that he can listen to the prayers of his people. So, that might be the explanation for this half hour of silence or just uh, an interlude of expect expectancy uh, that something big is about to happen. Well, we're going to have 
uh, the seventh seal opened. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, seven angels, again, the number of completeness. Uh, it just indicates the fullness. It could have been hundreds of millions. We don't know. But this is your apocalyptic symbolic language. And seven trumpets were given to them. Now, there are going to be seven angels because of seven trumpets. I did that on purpose to contradict myself because I wanted to bring out the number 7, 10, and 12 are numbers of fullness. But here you would take it in a literal sense because of the seven trumpets. Now, seven seals, seven trumpets. The seventh seal is going to open the door to the seven trumpets. Okay. Seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden offer before the throne. Now let me try to explain that. There was the bra what was called the brazen altar, which would, you would encounter as you first came into the temple. This is where the Levites, the priests, um, brought all the sacrifices, dealt with all the sacrifices that the people brought, let's say like a lamb or an oxen or depending. And they would perform those functions, just the ordinary person didn't do it. They were given to the priest, the priest did that. Uh, and the blood of the sacrificial animals went in front of the, of the altar. In other words, uh, to approach God, there had to be the blood atonement before you could enter into the God's presence. That's why the brazen altar, the large altar, was at the beginning. But this, this altar is called the golden altar of incense, or the golden censer. That stood in the holy, the, the holy place, right in front of the curtain that would be opened to enter into the Holy of Holies, where God's presence was. This, this censer was the one that the high priest on the Day of Atonement would go into and he would burn the incense on the altar. So what would happen was coals from the brazen altar would be placed on, the gold, on this golden censer. By the way, it was three feet high and a foot and a half square. Not very high, and it had little horns at the end, little curving things. And the, 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 uh, the coals from the brazen altar burning would be brought there, and then the incense would be placed on those coals, and they would make the smoke, and you could smell it. But on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would bring the blood of the sacrificial or the Passover lamb and place it on the coals on the golden censer. Now, that may be a little bit confusing, and it took me many years to get an idea of what was really going on because I had a hard time picturing it. But I think I sort of got it now. But So this, this revelation she uses all the images, uh, imagery from the temple that was in Jerusalem at John's time had been gone now for 20 to 25 years. Okay. So... And it says, and the smoke of the incense, see that the incense represented the prayer of the people. With the prayers of the saints rose before God, before God, from the hand of the angel. Okay. Uh, for Gentiles like myself, who, you know, I've studied this stuff, the Old Testament material, but I have a hard time connecting with it, I got to say. And I'm saying that for those of you who wish I'd go on to something else. Well, you got to go through the tough stuff too sometimes. Bible study, learning scripture isn't always an easy task. It takes literally decades, I have to say. Literally decades of diligent work on it to get, you, you get, you get the, uh, the basics, the ABCs, pretty easily. Pretty easily. But a lot of the finer stuff, and this is the finer stuff, it's not so easy. So you've got to kind of hang in there sometimes. Okay. 
Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Now, we don't know how, of course, I mean, what, you'd, you'd have to, John would have to have been transported to the moon to order to see that. So you understand that this is all code symbolism. And how this all took place, we do not know. John was not in a trance. He was fully mindful, fully alert. This is what he saw. Somehow God made it possible for him to observe this. Okay? It doesn't impact us so much, but if your people in John say, it would have. So this is to introduce the, um, the seven trumpets. Now, verse 6. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. Now this dramatic stuff. Now I could have gone through and read a bunch of passages from the Old Testament from places like Ezekiel and Amos and uh, Zechariah and a few other places and even some Psalms and you would have seen the same kind of language, apocalyptic kind of language, the book of Daniel, and so on. You would have seen, it would have reminded you of this. So John is reaching back, and he's pulling out all of this imagery, which he was well aware of, but not necessarily all the church would be. Those who were brought up in Judaism would have had a much easier time. And so left for people like myself, you got to struggle with it a little bit, and it's not quite clear. But now we're going to get into the seven trumpets. Okay, the seals are behind. They ended with the, days, the, the day of God's judgment. Now we're going to re, he's going to recycle. He's going to tell the story again. Now, you don't necessarily suppose that this all occurred at one time. Uh, some people have theorized that the Gospel of John um, records um, a number of sermons that John preached around the I am sayings or the ego I me sayings. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, with a lot of interludes and so on. And Revelation is, is frankly very similar to that. It's almost like there are sermons that John preached that were stitched together at some point. Like many commentators think that the Gospel of John was stitched together, the sermons. May, maybe so, maybe John did it himself. We don't know. But, so, so here's the second time around now. We're going to hear some of the th same things that we did with the seals, but in a different way of saying it. Now, verse 7. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and these were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Now remember that, and all green grass was burned up. We're going to find a little bit later that um, how there's still grass around. What you're looking at is apocalyptic language. If you take this literally, you're going to end up in trouble, and you're going to have to do a little mind-bending to make everything click. Telling a story. God's telling a story, revealing things to John. He's using imagery. One-third. I mean, how did you do that? Well, God, somebody says, can do anything. Yeah, God can do anything. But that's not really a good answer. It has to be taken in a symbolic way. The earth is being impacted. We don't know what that means. <clears throat> uh, climate change. <laughs> oh, I could get ridiculous here if I wanted to, uh, but I won't go that way. I, I am not. I am a very non-political kind of person, um, and I don't like arguments on either side. I'll listen to them, but I don't get on anybody's bandwagon. But um, 
These are not to be taken literally. But here, the earth is being impacted. The earth has always been impacted. The earth is an unfinished place. Uh, there are a lot of things that, you know, the rim of fire, uh, the earth is not settled. Uh, things are not stable. It continually changes and moves. But here is something dramatic now. Then, this verse 8, this <coughs> the second angel blew his trumpet, and something like, now notice something like, a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. Now we, <coughs> we have to admit that this imagery harks back to um, the, um, the exodus and the plagues under Moses uh, that occurred uh, with the people coming out of Egypt. So we find some of the same kinds of themes uh, taking place here. Um, we have to remember that when we're looking at something like the book of Revelation, it's the intent of prophecy and not the symbols that are important, the intent. <coughs> In other words, what's really being said here? Something like a great mountain burning with fire. Wow. It said a third of the living creatures in the sea died. Just a third. And a third, uh, <coughs> a third of the living creatures of the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. So a third of the sea is gone, a third of the living creatures, <coughs> which would naturally follow if a third of the sea was gone. And then a third of the ships, the ships is going to be very interesting, and I'm going to look at that in a little more detail in just a minute. But again, I remember trying to figure this out. There was a group of us in the Air Force when I was converted, and we would try to figure this out and make sense of it and coordinate this, Vern and Don and I. And it was it was pretty fanciful, and we had to take leave of our better rational senses sometimes to make this work. It wouldn't have been so difficult if we had realized that it was symbolic language here. What we're talking about is the earth is impacted. Now, one of the things that says that a third of the ships... Now, do you remember the story where, because of the crowd, Jesus had to get into a boat and teach the people from there because the danger of being overwhelmed by the press of people. Well, the word that's used for boat there is the same word here. Um, in 1 Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy, just a second, I'll find it. Um, <clears throat> in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, uh, where Paul is talking about heresies, he refers to it as a boat. It's a boat. That heretical teaching is a boat. And so some commentators have said that a third of the heresies were destroyed. Now, I'm not going to go for that. Uh, I don't really know what to make of it. If I had more solid information one way or another, I'd declare myself, but I don't. Very obscure. I just wanted to bring that out, I guess, for fun. Anyway, verse 10. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven. Now, here's where you realize, here's where you realize you're looking at apocalyptic imagery. Now, we are aware, unless this is a really dinky little star that has become a, a dwarf of some kind, that stars don't fall on little dinky planets, you know, sort of like, here's a little dinky planet, here's the huge... Not going to work. So we know that this is imagery. It's symbolic. Something's happening to the earth. He blew his trumpet and a great star fell from heaven. If a star fell from heaven, uh, just imagine that kind of a, an, uh, what do you call them? Uh, meteor or comet. Uh, it would uh, have some serious consequences not only to the, the earth, but the entire solar system and 
galaxy, I'm sure, uh, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers. A third of the rivers and on the springs of water. So here we have water, not the seawater, but water. The, uh, the thing that is necessary for life falls on a third, not all. And what can that possibly mean? Um, we don't really know. Uh, but we know that the judgment of God somehow is falling upon the natural earth, on all of the, that makes up our, our natural, uh, our natural um, our world. <clears throat> Verse 11 says, the name of the star is Wormwood. Wormwood. Now that comes, Wormwood is very interesting. Lamentations 3.15 says, he has filled me with bitterness. He has sated me uh, with Wormwood. Uh, wormwood, a plant that had a, has a bitter taste, grew in Israel, so people knew about it. So wormwood has the idea of bitterness. And some commentators have said this is in reference to false teacher, a false teacher, um, which kind of backs up the idea of the, the ships were destroyed. I don't exactly know what it means. Well, you know, biblical commentators would like to be sure about everything that they're talking about. But when you come to the book of Revelation and a number of other places in Scripture, you just have to say, I don't, I don't know, because to try to find an answer for everything puts you out on such a difficult limbs that it can be easily sawed off, and it's better to just say, not sure what this means. Very interesting. I don't get it. A third of the waters became wood, uh, wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. Perhaps that is something that we will see, but it could have symbolic languages. Because of the bitterness, maybe from the heresies, many people suffered greatly because of it. If you have a false teacher, you have a false prophet, and they reach world acclaim or regional acclaim, they are going to do a great deal of damage. More damage than almost anything you could imagine when you understand that the whole reason for our existence is to know God and there is a day of judgment. As a friend of mine has a sermon, eternity, eternity, where will you spend eternity? That is the issue, not anything else. Everything else is interesting and important, but secondary or far less. So that's the real issue is what people worship. It's who and what people worship is really the issue. Verse 12, the fourth angel. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck. Now, if you take that literally, <clears throat> of course, you know what happens. Delicate balance between us and the sun. Uh, just, a, just a little bit of tweak, a little bit here or there, and life as we know it is gone. So you see this is apocalyptic literature. A third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Could easily be in reference then to false teaching again that brings people into darkness or keeps them in darkness. Uh, and so it is with so much that to embrace some of these theologies is to envelop yourself in darkness, although you don't recognize it. I believe that that's what we're really looking at here. Verse 13, Then I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Whoa, 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 to those who dwell on the earth and at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels that are about to blow. So you have the first four trumpets. Now there's this eagle. Some people said, well, this is Jesus. I would say, no, this is not Jesus. This is a predator. The eagle would be the feared, powerful predator. 
And here is the predator looking for a, a meal, something to devour, um, to, to come down upon. Uh, the eagle crying with a loud voice, Whoa! Whoa, whoa, the three woes. We're going to find out about the three woes later on. Because three more trumpets are about to blow. Now, what I want to do, I want to read you a passage that is saying the same thing, but it comes directly from Jesus. I have turned to Mark chapter 13 and verse 24. Matthew chapter 24 uh, uh, John, yeah, Matthew chapter 24, uh, Mark chapter 13, and Luke um, chapter uh, 22, excuse me, 21, we have the descriptions of these apostles of what was going to happen in the last days. And I want to read these condensed version that all of the book of Revelation really hang upon. So I'm going to read you now Mark chapter 13, verses 24 to 27. These are the words of Jesus, whose disciples ask him, what's going to happen at the very last day? Okay, here it is. But in those days, after that tribulation, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened. And the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. To the Jewish person, to those apostles, it would very, be very clear what Jesus was saying. The time of judgment has come. There was a whole host of literature that stood behind this. All kinds of stuff that Jesus could have been thinking about that the disciples would have been aware of. That was which in the Old Testament, and that's what, which was in other apocryphal li literature. Standard stuff. Standard stuff. So the apostles know Jesus is now talking about the Day of Judgment. Verse 26. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. The second coming. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Now you'll find a similar passage in Matthew, similar passage in Luke. You put them together and you see exactly what John in Revelation is talking about. He just does it in a grander, more elaborate much more lengthy way, but it says exactly the same thing that Jesus had already said about three decades earlier. So long.